It's the first year I've actually tried making the uh, you know the slideshow in the presenter room and getting the, the the slides on the screen and testing that out, and it worked fine 15 minutes ago. So, what can I tell you? Anyway, this is the SQL t no the uh, Twitter um, <laughs> talk. So, um, I'm Chris Sumner. I'm so sort of representing a small charity called the Online Privacy Foundation where we've been doing some work to raise awareness or point out issues that uh, I think are of, uh, of interest and concern to this sort of audience in, part, in particular. Um, this is my co-presenter, Randall Wald from Florida Atlantic University. He came to the Q&A session last year after our Facebook talk um, and said, hey, did you guys think about machine learning? We said, well, we don't know the first thing about machine learning. He said, well, I'd sort of help you out. So it's really neat that he's been able to join us this year. So with this talk, we're really looking at the question of, well, uh, can you or, or can't you uh, predict personality traits through uh, Twitter and, you know, indeed other social media? Uh, we approached it with a sort of healthy degree of skepticism because you know this image here is of phrenology, which is uh, used to be pretty popular not so many years ago, um, and it had a whole host of problems essentially. So we decided, as we say in the UK, uh, to have a, a bloody good look um, and see what you could actually determine. So let me just explain sort of the talk outline, and you can see if this is the right you know sort of the right talk for you. Uh, we're going to start here with uh, sort of why we approach this. It's a question we've asked, been asked a, sort of a number of times in the media. Um, give a, an introduction to psychopathy. Talk about, briefly talk about sort of data collection and processing. If people want more input, come to the sort of Q&A session. Um, share the statistical results, the results that we got from the, the analysis. Uh, and then spend a, a big portion of time talking about machine learning. Uh, where we'll probably start off somewhat basic and go into something that um, I haven't got the foggiest what he's talking about. Um, but you might, uh, and then finish up with some, some conclusions and I guess more questions. So, you know, why did we uh, start this activity? Well, last year we uh, had a, uh, a project that we spoke about at DEF CON called the Big Five Experiment where we looked at personality traits in, um, in Facebook. And there was a reason we, uh, we did that. It's because we're seeing sort of figures and statistics like this. This figure here comes from uh, this year's Jobvite survey, um, where it's looking at social, uh, it's looking at recruiting essentially. And what it's saying is that 48% of hiring managers are always using online searches. So we were a bit concerned about whether they were doing that with any real sort of uh, weight behind it. You know, could, could, uh, science, if you like, support their, their decisions. Last year's figure was 45%, so it's a slight, slight uh, rise. So they're making judgments uh, about people, and we weren't sure whether those judgments were actually going to be accurate or full of problems. So that's what, you know, so that's what drove uh, some of our research. And also, at the time, um, and I think it, it's probably useful to be kind of open and give that context. At the time, I just had a, had a child, and anybody who's had a child will probably know. Actually, my wife had the child, but uh, I, was kind of, I had some involvement, um, I think. Anyway, I was... A, <laughs> I, I was involved in... Anyway, Ed, let, let's move on. Um, but sleepless nights, and I was wondering, you know, sleepless nights actually really affected me pretty badly, and I recognized that I was sort of maybe acting differently on social media than I would have been normally, and I was wondering whether that sort of stuff could get picked up by people and used perhaps against me as going, you know, this guy's a fruitcake, we don't want to hire him. Um, then last year, after our Facebook talk, we saw this study come out called Hungry Like the Wolf by Professor Jeff Hancock at Cornell. Um, Hungry Like the Wolf is a play on two things. One of it, it's um, the wolf is a, a predator, a psychopath is a, a predator. Uh, but I also emailed him and said, hey, has that got anything to do with Duran Duran? And, you know, expecting him to say, you know, go away, you idiot. And he was like, no, actually, me and the sort of co-author really liked that. But he studied a word pattern analysis of um, psychopathy in criminals. But that attracted this headline, which is the same sort of headline as the talk, Can Twitter Expose Psychopath Killer's Traits? And that's what we were, that's the question we're trying to at least uh, examine critically and have you guys maybe examine uh, along with us. Um, and what his paper actually said was that these findings on speech begin to open the window into the mind of the psychopath. Note that he didn't say, oh, it detects psychopaths. It's 
giving some idea that something's going on and might help our understanding of how their minds operate. Uh, Bruce Schneier um, was concerned that there would be a, you know, a, a high degree of false positives, and quite rightly. Um, earlier in the year, we saw you know, this post in the Telegraph. Can't confirm whether it's sort of true or not, but it looks like it, you know, it, there might be something there. FBI using Twitter to predict crime, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were using personality to, to draw the link of crime prediction. However, there is a paper that came out this year called Automatic Crime uh, prediction using events extracted from Twitter posts. Um, but that is also not personality driven, that, but it is language uh, driven. And there's been some studies into that with the London riots last year, uh, most notably from Manchester University. Um, we were either thrown a bone by the FBI uh, or, you know, in sort of light of the, the media that came out, or it was just pure coincidence. But this week, there was a sort of FBI bulletin about uh, language and psychopathy and psychopathy and how they sort of deal, deal with that. And this was a quote from, from that piece, which is available on, on, you know, on the web. Um, Individuals' language is one of the best ways to glean insight into their thoughts and general outlook. So I don't know if that was pure coincidence. I suspect it probably was. Um, crime prediction isn't new necessarily. This is a system run by uh, IBM to detect juveniles who may go on to become a, a problem for, for society. Um, we can look at that as being a bad thing, but it might be not such a bad thing if you're intervening in somebody's life and preventing them from going down a really, really bad path themselves and also uh, impacting other people's lives. So I don't think it's as clear cut as saying this is really bad and spooky. But maybe it is. There certainly needs to be discussion on that, I think. Um, next, with psychopathy, the, you know, the, sort of the media seem to uh, sort of maybe fixate maybe that uh, psychopathy leads to crime. But there are a number of papers that show, at least in terms of violent crime, that there's still a fi high false positive rate. So just because somebody's uh, scoring highly in psychopathy doesn't mean they'll go on to commit, commit violent crimes. And then our, our paper got some, uh, you know, sort of coverage in Fox News, which we weren't actually saying at all, as you'll, you'll bear my witness today, that we're not going to say psychopaths can be spotted on Twitter. So, um, but uh, maybe the answer is not less, not so much black and white. So let's have a quick look at uh, psychopathy. Um, there's a sort of general public interest in this. You've got here the, the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City bomber, uh, the night stalker, Richard Ramirez, and, uh, of course, you know, Ted Bundy, who's got a whole catalogue of different crimes behind him. Um, there's also movies. People have got a fascination with these. Psycho, um, The Shining, Texas Chain Chainsaw Massacre. Um, obviously, Science of the Lambs is a, a good example. My personal favourite, if you've not seen it, it's, it's a pretty good, uh, good film. No Country for, for Old Men. Uh, it's a guy who walks around with, like, a, an air canister and just pops people off. It's like a, you know, I don't know, a cattle... A machine used for killing cattle. Anyway, it's a great film. Go and see it if you've not. Um, so let's look at PCLR, which is a psychopathic, uh, psychopathy checklist uh, revised from uh, Bob Hare, who's kind of like the almost the godfather of psychopathy to some degree. Some will argue it consists of about 20 areas. Um, you'll score a, a zero for each of those categories if it doesn't apply uh, at all. Uh, if it applies to some extent, you'll get a one. If it applies and it's a reasonably good match, then you'll get a two. Um, so you can score zero, one, uh, or two on each of those sort of question areas uh, or omit the, uh, omit the answer if there's not enough evidence to make a decision. And you can have up to five omits. If we look at it, and this is a way I kind of conceptualize it, thinking about an equalizer, although more static than an equalizer, uh, most people are gonna score fairly low. So this is good news for society, otherwise we'd all be um, bumping each other off. I hope that translates. Um, <laughs> if somebody scores high in certain categories, it doesn't necessarily make them a psychopath. They might be an unpleasant individual, but they're not necessarily a, a, a psychopath. Or they may just be you know, a highly charged individual in certain circumstances. However, when you're scoring high in a number of those questions, that's when you've got, um, you know, the settings for a, a, an interesting problem, shall we say. 
Um, so speaking to, so I went on the PCLR course earlier this year, speaking to uh, Reed Malloy, who the author of The uh, Psychopathic Mind, he sort of categorizes it like this, or moderate and severe between 20 and 40, although there's a number of psychologists that don't like the idea of a cutoff. In general UK population, we see about 2.3 male, uh, 0.9 female, um, scoring, you know, kind of within a 25 or over uh, kind of category. This is a, a slightly different scale, but it maps to PCLR. Uh, in the prison community, you see that um, there's a, a different uh, distribution. So this is from a Dutch study where you see between 22, depend, between 22 and 37 uh, percent, depending on where you draw the, the cutoff. Uh, so there's a, an abnormal distribution of psychopaths in prison. Um, psychopathy is really divided into uh, two primary factors, personality, aggressive narcissism, and socially deviant lifestyle. And we're going to sort of whiz through these, really. Um, and there are two, uh, there are four facets involved with that, interpersonal and affective, which is kind of regarding emotion, and uh, lifestyle and, and antisocial sort of burglary crime record. And then you've got um, sex-related stuff and relationships under just general so social deviance. So uh, glibness and superficial charms, smooth talking, engaging, charismatic, slick. If you watch the TV show Apprentice, you'll see these sort of characteristics displayed pretty nicely. If you've got, uh, I'm not saying they're psychopaths, I'm saying that they're, they're <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but if you've got in the cab where you've got Steve Wynn talking about how good the win is and how, you know, I mean, that... That is a good example of superficial charm and glibness. I was chatting to the taxi driver, I said, does that get on your nerves? And he was like, tell me a story, my oh, man. So, um, and this is one of the things that led to uh, Hervey Cleckley's work, um, The Mask of Sanity, where he talks about there being uh, less than meets the eye. Either they deliver, deliver a, good, a good talk, um, but they, they can't walk it, essentially. Uh, then we've got a uh, grandiose sense of self-worth, which is really a, sort of related to narcissism, the cocky, opinionated, self-assured. These are the people that come to training classes that can be taught by the world's leading experts, uh, and they're going in with the mentality that this guy's not going to teach me anything because I already know it. There's also sort of the concept of a narcissistic takeover where you're claiming, uh, claiming success for somebody else's successes. So, um, you know, so if I was here saying, look at this, this is really cool. They made this all because I was going to be here. That would be kind of an example of a narcissistic takeover. The fact that it's true is, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, pathological lying. So people lie for different reasons, but generally most people lie to, to manage anxiety in some way. But your, your psychopath is almost a born liar. Uh, they're weaving elaborate stories. Some of them may seem implausible, but they deliver it with that glibness of speech so that it, you know, it translates to a, to a lot of people. They're doing it all the time. And that is almost a perfect toolbox for conning people. So I don't know how many people saw the art of con, um, but, uh, you know, this is, say, you know, a, a, a guy scoring high in those traits, ripping off these, these old people here. And he's able to do that pretty well, you know, making maybe uh, financial advice that's never going to benefit them in their life and leave them distraught, penniless and homeless when they've got no opportunity to make any money. You don't have to look far in the media to see that. But just because they're like that, they're still not necessarily a psychopath. That's an important point. But they're able to do this really well because they've got a sort of lack of remorse and guilt. So they're not going to worry about what they've done when they get home at night. They are completely devoid of feeling guilt. But guilt is a different construct, although it's related to empathy. Um, you can feel guilt from running a red light, but not necessarily uh, empathy. Um, we've also got the concept of a sort of shallower effect, a sort of limited range of depth of stony emotionalness. So, you know, here's a, a psychopath displaying joy, and here's a range of other emotions that the psychopath is displaying. Um, they're emotionless beings almost. Um, this you could also look at as being, this is a quote from Ted Bundy, it says, I'm the most cold-blooded son of a bitch that you'll ever meet. You could also load that onto sort of the narcissistic factor as well. Um, but, you know, it really shows that 
the guy is cold-blooded. And then uh, in terms of empathy, they've got a general lack of consideration or concern for the impact of whatever it is they're doing. And a non-psychopath may look at the dog and think the dog's going to be better off, you know, with a new home or what have you. But a psychopath isn't going to be thinking like that. The empathy of the situation isn't even going to occur to them. And if you want to read a good description of that, there's a great book by Simon Baron Cohen, and that name may be familiar because, you know, his brother Sasha Baron, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen or, or Barra or Ali G or whoever, uh, turns out they're both pretty smart. Uh, and this guy's got some really good uh, th this book is excellent if you want to understand more about sort of the general differences between guilt, uh, guilt and empathy. Then you move into this sort of failure to accept responsibility. Um, so here a guy is sort of describing what he did in, does in a very detached manner, almost like he had no choice. I was pissed off. He stepped into my space. I did what I had to do. I had a similar experience buying uh, a soda this morning when I was asked, do I want a banana or do, you know, part of me wanted to, to say, you know, if I wanted to buy a banana, I'd have bought a banana as well. A psychopath would have maybe taken that a step further and smashed the lady's head onto the, to the desk, possibly. <laughs> I was able to stop myself doing that, fortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so failure to accept responsibility. This is also seen in sort of corporate America and that sort of context, um, where this is a, a, a quote that's related to the recent LIBOR scandal in the UK where they've been fixing interest rates. It was described by one of the senior managers that's no longer a senior manager as an unfortunate series of events and that will be a complete failure to accept responsibility for their own actions and you'll see that in a corporate context a lot as well and if you want to see just how ugly that can get in a corporate context then I really recommend reading the book Snakes in Suits by uh, Babiak and, and Hare who were sort of the, the leaders if you like in talking about psychopathy. Uh, a need for stimulation you know we can look at um, a skydiver here, although evidence suggests that skydivers, the risk doesn't necessarily translate into uh, other stuff they're doing, so they can make reasonably good financial judgments, for example. Uh, this is more like um, Vegas-style need for stimulation, but it's not the odd spliff. It's, um, it's doing this all the time uh, and having a real fascination for this sort of stimulation. Uh, another way of considering this, if you look at a number of shooting kind of related murders and crimes, um, it's not uncommon to see them describe it as being, well, I was a little bit bored. I wanted to mix things up and just see what would happen. Um, and, you know, you, you can Google for that and you'll find, you know, some interviews like that. There's a, a parasitic lifestyle. So they're, they're leeching off people and they're going to move from person to person to, to meet their basic needs of food and shelter, essentially, and money, which they'll burn on the sensation seeking stuff. Um, that's why they're sort of uh, kind of manipulative people. Uh, and you'll also see that in work as well. They'll quite happily let others carry them, them along. But then they'll then use that grandiose sense of self-worth to have a narcissistic takeover and claim success for a project that they've pretty much done nothing on. Um, so kind of you can watch out for that. Um, the astronaut here is a, is a metaphor, really. Uh, when questioned in uh, prison settings, uh, the psychopath will often not have a, a, a realistic idea of what he's able to, to do. Maybe he wants to be a CEO or something where he's probably more likely to be delivering pizzas, but not for long because he's probably not going to hold his job down for too long before he gets angry and uh, wastes somebody. Um, this is from Gary Gilmore, um, a guy who uh, has been you know, uh, executed since. And one of his quotes was, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't planning, I was just doing. It was very impulsive. Uh, irresponsibility, sort of repeatedly stoned at work, not honoring debts, fired, uh, driving under the influence, but doing this all the time, a consistent pattern in your life. Uh, hot, hot headed, hot tempered. There's a caveat on Rage Boy. It turns out, you know, maybe more of a media thing picking up on him, but it's, you know, it's still a reasonably nice image. Uh, early behavior problems here. This is ages 12 and under, history of sort of truancy, robbery, vandalism, uh, class disruption, bullying, cruelty to animals. And when I talk about cruelty to animals, one of my uh, previous co workers who worked in sort of the psychiatric industry said, Oh, yeah, in, in terms of cruelty to animals, these guys, uh, you know, they had one patient where he uh, buried a cat up to its neck in, in the lawn and ran a mower over it. It's, it's that kind of cruelty to animals, not burning the odd ant. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty bad already at, at that stage. 
Um, and then it progresses into juvenile delinquency where you've got violence, fire starting, murder, attempted murder, rape, and you're seeing all of that sort of stuff uh, over and over again. So now you can get the idea that psychopathy isn't just because somebody tells a good lie. They're going pretty well beyond that. Um, they're probably going to skip bail, um, escape from prison, try and escape from prison. Um, these are the factors that aren't loaded. So promiscuous sexual behavior, not you know one or two instances, but continuous pattern through their lives. Many short-term relationships. So, you know, use the image of a, a player. And, and this was my favorite from the course. It's called criminal versatility. So you can't just be a good murderer. You've actually got to have sort of theft, robbery, kidnapping, arson. You know, so six of these will get you a score of two. Uh, or uh, four or five will get you a score of one. Um, so it's not just, oh, you've committed a few, a few robberies. So psychopaths are, are more violent. They commit more crimes. They're more likely to use a weapon in their crimes. Their violence is both predatory and effective. That means they're going to react to something, and they're also going to go after people. They're likely to go after strangers because they can smell weakness. They've got no guilt, so they're really the perfect predator, so the, the image is a nice match. Uh, there's discussion that there, there's no, not really any treatment for psychopathy, or there's a school of thought that says that, but it gets pretty interesting. Um, there's a guy called Jim Fallon who's spoken at, um, at TED Talks, and he'd looked at um, sort of brain images, and these are the kind, kinds of images they saw. So the control set here, um, there's more brain uh, activity in the frontal lobe. For a murderer, there's, there's less. Um, it turns out his brain was like the one of a murderer. Um, so that you know, this spooked him a little bit. Uh, there's more. There's more sort of evidence emerging here. This says you might think this guy's being a total tosser, says Dave Owens, an officer for 19 years. But when he describes the abuse he had as a child from his father, the jigsaw fits. And this from a study that's come out in, in Norway and is gaining some traction now as well. All offenders have experienced gross instability, neglect, and or abuse from their family of origin. So this is either extreme neglect or extreme over-controlling. Um, and that leads to a, a, a sort of a, a metaphor that um, Simon Baron Cohen uses in his book where he talks about the pot of gold. So the formative years of a child's upbringing can influence even the brain, you know, the brain structure. Having the having the decent upbringing can reduce the possibility of them going off into a sort of a life of violent crime. So um, there's a there's a lot of research going on in that space now to look at is there some way of um, essentially an intervention. So let's talk quickly about the uh, data collection. We created an application. The application. Um, essentially asked a number of questions. These are the psychopathy ones. I like to get revenge on authorities. I avoid dangerous situations. That one's reversed. Payback needs to be quick and nasty. People often say I'm out of control. It's true that I can be cruel. People who mess with me always regret it. I have never gotten into trouble with the law. That's also reversed. I like to pick on losers, and I'll say anything to get what I want. Um, so we took that and a whole bunch of Twitter attributes from 2,927 participants of the study um, and essentially analyzed that on a, a little HP microserver running Ubuntu CatchDB with some sort of custom uh, Python scripts to call it the Twitter API. Now, in terms of the um, answers that we saw, or the, the uh, analysis that we saw, we saw this distribution, um, which shows that most people, fortunately, are not high scoring on the, the psychopathy scale. Uh, if we look at that, the GB study earlier, the, the Great British study, and, and ours, you can see a, a kind of a similar curve almost, although it's important to note that we use different measures and scales, so there's some variation. Uh, in terms of correlations between the big five uh, traits, what you see here with the blue bars was a study um, conducted by Del Paul Huss at British uh, Columbia, and the green bars are from, from our study. So we see, for example, agreeableness, we see similar direction in um, a, you know, a negative correlation, and the same with conscientiousness. You'll note that there's a difference in neuroticism, but this could well be because of the, sort of the measures that we've used. Interestingly, though, we saw the same sort of correlations when we looked at the attributes in, in, uh, in Twitter. So that is either pure chance or it adds some credibility. So we, we end up with... Um, attributes that were significant were geo-enabled, number of tweets, notifications, fairly weak, but, um, but nevertheless um, significant. The clout score for psychopaths was 
0.051. For narcissists, it was 0.088, so a little bit higher, as you might expect. Uh, for linguistic analysis, we've got swearing, anger, death, negative emotion, filler words. Um, you can see that the significance is higher than it is for the attributes there. And in terms of negative correlations, meaning they say less of these things, positive emotion, uh, family, work, work relates to the parasitic lifestyle, so that's kind of interesting. And the use of we because they're not really social creatures, so they're going to use less of we, us, our, because they're, you know, they're, they're lone wolves. This was a, an area that we found pretty fascinating, so we included this into, you know, coded this into our data set as well. When we looked at low-scoring psychopathy, we saw people tweeting around this sort of frequency. Um, of course, there are differences, uh, but generally we saw it around, you know, around this area. But when we look at high-scoring psychopaths, we see much more tweets. When we look at those tweets, they're more angry tweets as well. Um, so we saw see much more uh, erratic tweeting almost, uh, and that may be related to sort of this sense of boredom or what have you. But overall, it, it's interesting. The results are consistent with uh, two other papers that have been done on sort of linguistics and the dark triad, but the statistics are still relatively weak for basing a decision that's going to, you know, impact somebody's life potentially. So as we look at uh, machine learning, I just intro introduced the topic here. The reason, you know, one, one of the things we're attempting to do here is classify the people, the tweeters, as instances. Um, they're going to have a number of independent attributes. So those will be the features that we've selected, the linguistic analysis and such like. And then a number of dependent attributes, either a class, high or low, or uh, a psychopathy score. And then we'll take all of those, uh, those independent attributes, the features, uh, to predict the classes and build build using training data and validate it with test data, essentially. Um, and the reason we're doing that is there's pretty much there's too much data to understand quickly, and it's too difficult or, or it's too challenging, really, to do with statistical analysis. It's not impossible, but uh, too difficult. And stakeholders will typically want results, you know, sooner. How you approach this is going to depend on the question you're really trying try to answer. Um, and that will really influence the sort of results you're going to get. But for our study, we really focus on spotting the top N on psychopathic scorers, um, either the top 10% or the top 1.4, as we'll, we'll discuss. So um, we have the concept of true and false positives, which uh, I think Randall is going to uh, talk to you guys about and talk a little bit more about the results we've seen through, uh, through machine learning. Okay, so I'm to repeat, I'm Randall Wald, and as Chris was discussing, we have, you know, true, in this case, positive is referred to the, the psychopathy class. Now, obviously, psychopathy is not positive, but for convenience, we refer to the minority class, which is the, as the positive class, and as discussed, psychopaths are the minority, fortunately. The so true positives are when a model predicts a, a member of the minority class correctly. False positives is when you say someone is a psychopath, but you're wrong, they're actually perfectly healthy. True negatives and false negatives, analogously, true negatives are correctly saying someone is normal. False negative is when you take someone you say they're normal, but they're actually a psychopath. So, problem with trying to evaluate models that have this type, use these models, um, false positives, false negatives, is that you don't have the same number of individuals who are positive and negative. For example, this is an example, a skew distribution where the majority of individuals are normal, the minority are in the extreme end of the psychopathy scale, they're much higher in this measure than everyone else. Now, if you try to simply classify, you know, so I find what's the most accurate model I can find, or I want to minimize the average error of my model, you'll get everyone in this sort of big blue box here correctly. You'll say, you know, I guess most people are normal, so I'm going to just predict normal. Or I'm going to say, I want to guess an, an average value close to, you know, the population mean. And that will give you a high average, a lower average error or a higher overall accuracy, but you're going to miss all of these individuals here. You're going to miss the individuals who are at the extreme end who are in the positive minority class. And unfortunately, those are the ones you care about most. Those, you, your goal here is to figure out who are the psychopaths who are in the minority class. So you can't just evaluate models looking at your average error or looking at the overall accuracy. So you need to use some performance metrics that are based on more refined views of these things. For example, true positive rate, which is true positives over all positives. False, true negative rate, which is true negatives over all negatives. 
false positive rate, et cetera, and then arithmetic mean and geometric mean are ways of trying to find models that balance your true positive rate and your true negative rate because you don't want to have extremes for either of those that's just not going to give you a useful, usable model. And one way to find models that try to balance these well is what's called using the ROC curve. This is a graph as you change the decision threshold, you change how likely you are to classify a person as positive. And you, if you move this along, you're going to affect both your true positive rate and your false positive rate. And this graph shows you how, how this um, values change over the full scale of the threshold. And you can see the um, dotted line going up the middle there. That is, if you had a random model, you'd expect that as you, you know, increase the threshold, you increase both true and false positives. A good model should do better than that. It should go to the upper left of that curve. It should be giving you higher values. And one way to try to evaluate the quality of a model is instead of looking at any one point on this curve using what's called the area under the curve, AUC, which is just integral of the area under the curve and the higher the value the better. One would be ideal but you take what you can get. So I'm going to let Chris talk briefly about clap. So uh, one thing we, we did was we found that there was this uh, data, this might be interesting actually, the uh, data science company in San Francisco called Kaggle.com um, and they host data science competitions. You can either run them as uh, public competitions and invite people from all over the place to participate or private competitions where it's closed and just limited to a, a number of data scientists. Um, they work with you to uh, shape and create your, sort of your data set. Um, essentially then you host a, a competition where uh, data scientists from around the world will compete with the best models. This we felt uh, in terms of crowdsourcing was an interesting way of looking at how we can find maybe the best models that, you know, the, the quickest. Um, in doing this we had 113 teams compete and created over 1,000 uh, models. So um, in terms of if you've got a data science problem but you don't have the skills actually, we found this actually quite, quite useful and, and for non-profits the, the fee is, uh, is minimal. Uh, so Randall's going to talk a little bit more about the results from that um, and then talk about some of the results that he's had in, in his research. Okay, so this curve is exactly like we were looking at earlier. It's a ROC curve with true positive rate and false positive rate as you change the decision threshold. And you have across the middle, you have that gray line which is how well the random model would do. Now the other two lines you'll see are the black line which is using the benchmark Kegel model which is a simple um, random forest model. It's, uh, I'll go into that in the Q&A if you want more details. But then the winning Kegel model was able to do a little better than that. See this the red line there. And you have across the side kind of small uh, the area under the curve. The benchmark Kegel model was able to do a AUC area under the curve of 0.64 while the winning Kaggle model got 0.66. And some of the other models did more poorly than that. Now again, it's important to look at the AUC and look at all the decision thresholds because if you look at accuracy you get very misleading results. For example, these are the same results, the same models looking at it in terms of accuracy. And it's a dotted line at 90% which is the accuracy of the random model because in this case we're considering 10, we're trying to classify the top 10% psychopathic individuals versus 90% normal. So if you just assign no everyone as normal, if you say every single person in the model is as trivial as possible, you're going to get 90% accuracy which sounds good until you remember you're missing all the actual positive instances. So you can see that the Kaggle winner and the Kaggle random force benchmark are very close to 90% in terms of accuracy but they don't necessarily do what you want. They don't necessarily capture the actual um, positive instances. For example, this is the confusion matrix for the winning model. You see of the 125 individuals who are considered to be psychopaths here, only two were accurately correctly predicted to be psychopaths. The other ones were all false negatives, people who were really positive instances but labeled as negative. On the other side, there were no false positives. So it always is a matter of finding the threshold that balances your errors in the way you want them to because you can never have no false positives and no false negatives. You need to decide where you want to draw the line there. 
So my own research has focused on a slightly more difficult problem. Rather than looking at the top 10% of individuals as being psychopaths, we're looking at the top 1.4%. And that's a very small number. The data set we're using had about 2,914-ish instances, plus or minus 30, close enough. Um, only 41 of those were considered psychopaths from this data set. So the goal is to build a model which could actually detect with some accuracy, some, some performance, those very small number of individuals while minimizing as much as possible our false positives and false negatives. So one way to try to alleviate the problem of having this hugely imbalanced data is to use what we call sampling. And the, the principle here is very simple. Your data set is imbalanced. You want to fix it to make it balanced. And a simple technique to this is just to either randomly remove instances from, minority from the majority class, i.e. remove negative instances until the balance is more like what you want, or to duplicate, make extra copies of the, major the minority class instances, the positive instances. And now it sounds very like naive, you're just throwing away data, you're just duplicating data. It actually works extremely well. We've done research comparing this to other techniques that are more algorithmically intensive and this actually works extremely well. And the one other benefit of undersampling specifically, which is what was done in our, my research or with Chris here, is that it also reduces the data set size. So you can get your results faster because you're not working on 2,900 instances all the time, you're working on a smaller number because you've thrown away some of that data. Now, obviously, if you throw away data like that, you're going to have a weaker model. It's not going to be as accurate. One way you can try to fix that is called ensembles. Two heads are better than one. So you want to take these multiple weak models and put them together to give you a stronger, more powerful resulting model. So one trick here is that if all the weak models are just the same, adding them together does nothing. You need to have these diversity among the models so that even if one only captures part of the data, one only captures certain ways of identifying psychopaths, you put all these models together and you're able to get a ensemble model that will actually give you accurate results. So the technique, one technique we developed is called Rust Boost, random undersampling boost. This combines random undersampling, which discussed earlier with boosting, which is an established form of ensemble um, classification. The premise of boosting is you build a model and then you look at which instances, which people were classified correctly and incorrectly. And you give extra weight to those who are classified incorrectly and reduced weight to those who are correct. Then you build the model again. And you iterate this process multiple times, each time building the model and trying to change the weight so that those that were done incorrectly are more likely to be done, classified correctly in the next round. Then once you have all of these models, you put them together into your ensemble weighted by the accuracy of each model to try to take different views of the data. So each of these individual models will classify certain instances based on how accurate they are, but collectively they'll give you a good performance over all of the instances. And Rust Boost is a variant on this which applies random undersampling within each round of the boosting to provide an additional source of variation and also to help the models work better because they are the more balanced data. So the model building process would normally fail with 1.4% minority class. Suddenly it's not doing so poorly. It's got much more usable data to work with. One other aspect of the data we have here is there are a number of different features. Discussed earlier features and classes. In this data set we had nearly 100 features between the profile information like number of tweets, frequency of tweets, number of friends, and then the text information like you know, obscenities, anger, um, we, all those text attributes. Almost 100 of them collectively, but they're not all going to be equally useful. So feature selection will rank them by their usefulness towards the class and then say, I only care about the top 20 of these. The rest of them are all irrelevant. And this will help reduce your data set size because you're using many fewer features to build your model and also can give you more accurate results because the irrelevant information has been thrown away. 
So the combined model we're using for using all of these techniques together is called select rust boost, select random undersampling boost, which has feature selection. I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works, trying to go pretty quickly. Unfortunately, I, I can't shoot the laser around the corner, so the red dot is where the laser pointer would be if I had one. So the model starts with your data, and you have a, a initialized weight vector that has that all values are equal. Everything has starting weight of, you know, equal to each other because you don't know anything initially. Then you're going to repeat this algorithm n times, so the study n equals 10, basically going to go over create 10 models. Each time you first use random undersampling to sample your data to figure out, to reduce it down, make it more balanced, and using the weights as well for that. Then you perform your feature selection on your sample data to figure out which features are most useful from that data toward identifying psychopaths. Then you actually build the model, and you're actually going to do two things. You see two lines coming off of this. You're going to save a copy of this model for the final ensemble, but you're also going to evaluate it to say how good this model is based on what you have. And you store that, that weight parameter on the side as well, and you use that in the model to figure out what your new weight vector should be, to update which instances were correct, which instances were incorrect. So that when you repeat the entire process, starting, you know, back at the sampling, you're going to focus more on the instances that were classified incorrectly. And finally, once you've done this as many times as you want, you combine all of your models into the final model based on the weights to give you the classification values for your instances. So the results of using both Rust boost and select Rust boost on the data are as follows. With six of the seven uh, underlying modeling techniques we're using, we found that Rust boost was better than using no boosting. However, with the select Rust boost, we found that it was always an improvement. We always got better AUC values, better true positive and true negative rates than when we had no boosting here. So this shows the importance of these ensemble techniques when you have such complicated data, such, such imbalanced data, you, you need, individual models are going to be weak and not as powerful as you'd like. You need to use ensemble approaches to combine them and create more accurate models. So we've also performed ANOVA analysis and Tukey analysis to verify that our using boosting, using these ensembles is statistically significantly better with alpha of 5% than not using ensembles. So this is validated statistically. And the best results we had using our, the best choices of modeling technique, feature selection, number of features, et cetera, we got a true positive rate of 0.707, a true negative rate of 0.719, and AUC area under that ROC curve of um, 0.746. And to put that into confusion matrix terms, you can see we have, of the 41 individuals who are classified as positive, really 29% we got correctly. Now 12, that's one of nine individuals I should say are correct. 12 individuals weren't correct, unfortunately. Those were our false negatives. And we had 808 false positives, i.e. people who were not actually psychopaths, but who nonetheless the model said was psychopaths. And this underscores the problem that you're never going to eliminate both false positives and false negatives, you need to make sure that when you use the model, you deal with that fact. And I think Chris had some additional comments to make about that and some concluding remarks. Thanks very much, Randall. Much appreciated. I mean, this, this is one of the points that we've seen. There's been a number of uh, news articles over the, the last couple of years about Facebook can be predicted within 10%, but, you know, that really falls into the whole accuracy uh, issue, which Randall uh, described earlier. So, okay, so, you, you know, you're, you're identifying 29 out of 41, but you've also pulled in 808. Um, you know, what possible use is that? So, you know, first of all, you, you, we see 808 is a sort of high number of false positives. But if you combine that with closed source data, such as the criminal records or backgrounds, genetic history or what have, what, what have you, you're probably going to be able to lower that, uh, that margin uh, quite considerably. There's research from a gentleman called Mitya Back, uh, who's looked at combining multiple measures of personality and has, in all cases, increased the correl correlation coefficient uh, significantly, so improving the accuracy of personality prediction. So if you had access, let's say, your you know, FBI or what have you, I'm imagining, um, then you'd probably be able to weed down that 800 and something uh, false positives even further. Um, so, I mean, how could that be of use? Well, you know, if, for example, you're in the FBI and you, you, you've got uh, somebody 
um, I don't know, in, in custody, having a, an idea about whether they may be um, psychopathic or not might influence the decision to use somebody who's been cert through a certain interview technique or something like that. It's a possibility. I, I don't know. I was kind of reading a little bit about this on the, the FBI site. Um, and you can read more about that as well. If you just Google sort of FBI and psychopathy, you'll probably you know find this, or I can you know give you the link in the Q and A. Um, but I think it's probably more useful, really, for observing changing levels of antisocial personality traits if they are changing or not. Um, and depending on your viewpoint, that's either going to be a good or a bad thing. And I don't, I'm not going to put a position forward that says I think it's good or bad. I'm really just saying I think it's interesting and requires more research and a lot more discussion. If you want to read about that antisocial changes in society, then this is a really great book to have a look at as well, Unmasking the Psychopath, uh, which talks about sort of social crises, psychopathy. And there's a section in there where a gentleman in 1830-something was talking about uh, the impact of industrialization causing a moral insanity, uh, brackets, psychopathy. And I wonder whether you know, we're seeing changes in psychopathy or antisocial traits as well. The more agentic countries like the US and the UK that's sort of more individualistic you see higher levels of psychopathy than you do in communion countries uh, like Taiwan for example so here in um, in the US and the UK you've got that sort of one to five percent depending on the population that you measure but in Taiwan you're seeing that sort of point naught one or point one you know so you're seeing a lot less um, in communion countries, but we, we don't really know why. So from a research perspective, I think it's a, a fascinating area of research if you can just put the sort of the more sensational headlines aside and, and look at that. So it might help us understand uh, a little bit more about this whole concept of, of cyberbullying, which is, is, you know, probably not very well un understood really, but it's going to have a massive impact on the next generation of people coming up. My little boy, for example... Um, you know, how do, how do we uh, understand the impacts on, on our young people? Uh, and of course, as Jeff Hancock had mentioned in his paper, knowing a little bit more about the inner workings of sort of the psychopathic or antisocial mind probably helps us understand that and might even help us uh, in, in slightly other contexts. Important to mention a couple of the limitations that we've had. Obviously, it's a self-assessment. Um, so you could argue that people have gained that um, maybe but you know the, the the research or at least on a, on a broad scale is consistent with uh, other papers it's not a widely used uh, assessment so we didn't use PCLRSV for example we used a, a relatively new test by Del Paul at British Columbia called short dark triad um, you could argue that there's a selection bias because we got a you know a tweet from Stephen Fry which bumped our numbers up from 24 participants to just over 2,000 overnight. Um, so you, you know you could argue that that's that that influenced it, and also the linguistic analysis of, of Twitter. Um, I spoke to the gentleman who created that um, linguistic program, James Pennebacher at University of Austin um, or University of Texas in Austin, um, one of the two. And looking at the language that people use on social media and on Twitter is, is obviously going to be, be different in, in some ways. So the, the, those are limitations which research would have to overcome in a variety of contexts in looking at social media. Um, overall, really, it's important to keep in mind that the research in social media is really uh, at the sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and we as a, as a group in, in DEF CON, for example, have a real opportunity to partner with people who are studying sort of psychology, the social sciences, and, and help add sort of the data uh, mining, but also have a, an important part to play in terms of discussing or generating discussion about the social implications of privacy, unfair invasion of privacy, particularly those 48% of hiring managers. Is that ever acceptable? Uh, so that's kind of the residual question is we kind of showing that we can determine things about personality and evidence suggests that the more we know about people, different measures, we know we're going to get better accuracy. But we haven't really tackled the question of should we? And that's a question or a thought I'd like to, to leave with the, the audience. So I appreciate everyone turning up. Um, thank you very much for your time. We'll be in the Q&A afterwards. Thank you.